Hi, in this video, let's take a look at this WaveTag 395 12-bit 100 MHz synthesized arbitrary waveform generator. I spotted this unit on eBay a couple weeks ago uh, for a very attractive price. Since I don't have an arbitrary waveform generator and I don't want to spend hundreds of dollars on a brand new one, I thought this would be a great addition to my lab equipment. Now the reason I suspect I got this one cheap is because it was listed in a uh, non-working condition, but pretty much everything listed with the same seller was marked as non-working. And also the seller has an excellent feedback score, so I thought it would, might be just that the seller genuinely doesn't have time or equipment to properly test it. And as it turned out, everything seemed to be working just fine with this unit, at least according to my preliminary testing. So I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, one thing to note is that although this uh, unit is marked as a uh, 100 megahertz synthesized arbitrary waveform generator, the actual labeling is kind of uh, uh, misleading because the 100 megahertz is actually the clock frequency and to output a waveform of the simplest form, for example, a square wave, you need to uh, two sample points. So essentially, the maximum achievable waveform frequency for this uh, arbitrary waveform generator is only at 50 megahertz. So just something that, uh, you know, I think it's just a marketing uh, gimmick that made you believe that it's actually much faster than it actually is. But besides that, it's nevertheless a very good uh, arbitrary form, waveform generator. And if you look, take a look at the specs, uh, indeed the highest frequency it can generate is uh, 50 megahertz for a square wave. And for sine, uh, the maximum frequency drops to 40 megahertz and the triangular waveform, it further drops to just uh, at 10 megahertz. But overall, at least on paper, this AWG looks pretty impressive, even though it was made, um, you know, 15, at least 15 years ago. Although it's hard to compare it with the modern AWG, uh, but just to give you some perspective, spec-wise, it compares quite well to the RIGO DG2041A. And in fact, besides the vertical resolution being 12 bits, Compared to RIGO's 14-bit, the waveform 395, uh, the, not waveform, the WaveTag 395 actually surpasses the uh, RIGO's performance figure in quite a few areas, and even compares quite favorably with the uh, Keysight 33250A. Uh, now, the only thing perhaps uh, uh, it's lacking is that it only has one, a single uh, output channel, and a lot of the uh, modern ones have at least two output channels so that you can, uh, you know, set two signals in a uh, particular phase configuration. And before we uh, take a look at what's inside, let's take a brief look at how an arbitrary waveform generator works. So the basic idea behind a AWG actually is quite simple. So basically we have a uh, waveform memory stores the data of each waveform uh, wave points, right? So it's uh, you know, the point number one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, five, and so forth. And uh, then there's a clock signal. So basically we have a uh, clock that we can read through the waveform memory. And uh, the speed at which it reads determines the actual waveform frequency that it generates. So the faster I read through the waveform, the faster the generated waveform is, the higher the frequency. So then we can uh, convert the red signal through a DAC. So basically we can put a DAC here and then we can get our output waveform sig signal like that. So basically there are a couple of methods to control the output frequency of the generated waveform. And the first one, as I mentioned before, uh, which was the easiest to understand is to vary the clock speed. Besides raising the clock frequency for higher waveform frequency, we can also downsample the data points with a lower clock rate. 
So, for example, if we wanted to do it faster, we uh, can down, downsample this waveform. Now, this waveform doesn't uh, uh, downsample very well because it doesn't have that many data points. So we imagine we have, you know, quite a few of these data points. Then we can say instead of reading through that sequentially, we can first do one, do three, uh, five, and so forth. So of course the uh, uh, you know when the waveform is complicated, um, you may lose some of the waveform details when doing the downsampling. So typically the sampling is shifted every single time by some uh, you know either random or some predetermined fates. So the first round, when it goes around, it reads the one, three, five. The second time, maybe it reads two, four, and five, something like that. These are really just some of the two basic um, methods for generating arbitrary waveform. And uh, sometimes these are used in conjunction with one another. Now, one in inherent problem of this downsampling is that um, depends on you know how you sample this waveform. So if you have a abrupt edge, for example, if you say something like a you know short pause, right? So you could could have run into a situation where uh, in one sample you you sample it three times, and another round you sample it two times. So it causes a considerable uh, jitter in the actual output put waveform. So the you know, waveform would look like sometimes like this, sometimes like that. So and here is your clock jitter. But there are other ways to minimize that um, as well. So anyway, so what do we expect to see from inside this uh, uh, WaveTag 395? Now, from what we discussed here, at least we would see a high-speed DAC, uh, which is the one responsible for converting the waveform into the actual uh, the memory uh, location into the actual waveform, and of course some memory. And we would expect that there's some input output stage and to, to provide the uh, low impedance output. And perhaps some you know microprocessor or controller uh, type to facilitate all this action. And also um, b because you know we are varying the clock speed or we're doing some kind of uh, synthesizing. So I am also expecting to see that uh, there is a phase lock loop. Uh, somewhere in this unit. So let's um, uh, start taking it apart and we'll see what's inside. Now this unit only has, um, let's see, it's a little bit heavy here. Um, I think it only has these two screws on the side and if we remove these we should be able to uh, get it to open up. So let's, let me do that. Wow, it's uh, a little bit uh, tight. You might not be able to see that, but uh, okay. The reason is uh, the actual screw it has some thread lock on it. Anyway, so let me remove the other one, and we'll be right back. Okay, so now the two side screws are removed. We should be able to just slide it out, and here we go. And here you go, that's the, uh, the inside. And as you can see that uh, uh, this is just a single board construction and it doesn't have any shielding, at least not anything I can see. And this is okay because the frequency we're talking about here is only um, you know, at a clock frequency of 100 meg megahertz, uh, it's relatively low. Now later on we're gonna, uh, this is a uh, power supply box here. Later on, we're gonna try removing this because this is blocking some of the components underneath. But uh, this is a switching power supply. It looks like they just got one from off the shelf one. But the input, uh, the output rather, has a minus 5.2 volts. So that looks like it's a uh, ECL type of supply voltage. So we will see if we can find anything that using that uh, minus 5.2. And then we'll have the plus 5, uh, plus 17.5, and minus 17.5. And here is where the main switch comes in, as you can see, the main switch. Now, this I'm a little surprised actually, it's very close uh, to the circuit board. And I suppose it's uh, wrapped around and uh, in this uh, insulating tubing. 
but still, you know, it's uh, it's dangerously close to the circuit board. But um, well, I guess uh, you know it doesn't really. Uh, probably the designer thinks that that's uh, adequate uh, separation distance there. Anyway, so inside we have this uh, lithium uh, battery here uh, that's for storing the waveforms basically and all the configuration settings and uh, uh, the equipment back then didn't have any flash memory inside so they have to have this kind of uh, uh, battery powered uh, sorry, battery backup for the, the SRAMs. Now, um, let's take a look. Actually, I haven't measured it yet, even though there were two, um, there, there was something back here, as you can see, um, for measuring the battery voltage. There, were, uh, But I didn't measure it before. So let me take a look at to see if uh, uh, we can make any reasonable reading here. So the battery here, let me just uh, do this too. It really doesn't matter which side is which. And it's uh, surprisingly, it's a 3.126. So the battery is actually pretty, pretty good. I wonder if that's the original one. Uh, if it is, that will be really impressive because this thing has been there for a long, um, long time. Anyway, so let me re remove this uh, uh, power supply and uh, we will dive into the circuit a little bit uh, further okay so now the power supply is out of the way and uh, let's take a closer look at the circuit now I don't think I need to uh, remove this board totally because I don't think there's anything uh, underneath but uh, we can take a look a little bit later uh, to see if it you know if it's just a double-sided board so what is underneath this uh, here is a DG1236, which is a, uh, a power supply monitor uh, IC. So basically, it's responsible to reset the circuit uh, if you know if uh, it loses power. So I thought the best way to show you what the circuit is uh, inside this unit is to follow our diagram that we had a little bit earlier, and as you can see here. This is our main 10 megahertz oscillator, and this one is just a standard crystal. Uh, it's not even a temperature compensated one, but uh, for, from a stability perspective, that should be sufficient for this 100 megahertz uh, unit. Now, if you wanted more stable uh, source, you can always take an external clock signal and uh, lock it that way. So. As I mentioned earlier, we were expected to see a, uh, a PLL circuit, and as you can see here, we do have a MC1648P, which is a uh, VCO circuit, and VCO is typically a building block for your PLL. So I'm sure that uh, they, uh, that's how they implemented the PLL. And uh, if you look uh, carefully here, we have a NE5 to, uh, 521N, which is a uh, high-speed uh, differential comparator, which is probably used, if I have to guess, is to sync the uh, external uh, clock that come in. And towards the right, we have this uh, uh, chip here. Actually, I cannot, for the life of me, find any information on this chip. Now, there were there was a one post on the discussion forum saying that this is probably a uh, either a custom chip or a um, some kind of uh, gate array type of uh, uh, chip. Now, actually. Uh, now I'm quite happy that this unit is working because if anything's wrong with this chip, uh, there's no way for me to find a replacement for that. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, and we also have some kind of memory in this unit to store the waveforms. And as you can see, these are exactly uh, the memory chips here. So these are the Toshiba TC551001s. And these ones are 128K uh, times 8, so 8 bit. So it's basically 128K each. And these are probably responsible for storing the waveforms and some other parameters, 
when the unit is in operation. So as we mentioned earlier, that the stored waveform needs to be uh, output driven by a DAC. So let's see where we can find the DAC. And aha, uh -huh. so DAC is right here. So if you take a look at the chip, uh, half is hidden under that uh, metal bar. Unfortunately, it cannot remove it because it was welded on it. Okay, so that is an analog devices AD9712, which is a 12-bit, 100 mega sample per second date, uh, digital to analog converter. So that's actually a very fast uh, uh, DAC. So now in order to achieve that speed, it actually uses ECL rather than standard TTL. So naturally, we have this uh, chip right underneath here to do the TCL, uh, ECL to TTL conversion, which is this chip right here. And now if you look at this uh, chip here, that's a AD9617. It's a low distortion precision wideband op-amp. So that is uh, needed uh, to drive the output circuit. In terms of the output, and we can see that's exactly what this section is. So we have these uh, heat sink transistors. So these are actually uh, 2N5943 and 2N5583. These are high fre frequency NPN and PNP pairs. Uh, they are responsible for the push-pull output stage. And we have a bunch of uh, relays and uh, some precision resistor network. And uh, you know we have lots of relays, actually. So all these are presumably for the output and input switching, because we do have many uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 input and output uh, BNC, BNCs there. And uh, so now if you take a look here, we also have some fast 7-4 uh, series, very fast 74F821. These are 10-bit D flip-flops. And uh, interestingly, we have uh, two hybrid chips here. These are on the ceramic substrate, and these are presumably, just by the, by the letter designation here, I think these are the filters. And beside this uh, 100 th uh, 329PC octo ECL TTL bidirectional tra translator here, we see, uh, we also have quite a few of these uh, these uh, ECL and uh, TTL uh, translators. For example, these are the MC110H125. You can probably uh, read if the, uh, actually I'm not sure if you can read this, but there are also a few of these, quite a few of these right here. And at the back end here, towards the middle, that's where our power supply portion is. So basically, the switching power supply uh, comes in right here to these two sockets, and they get regulated by this linear, linear regulator. So LM317 and 337, one for positive, one for negative. So that provides the voltage to the rest of the unit. And if we move down here, we see this uh, chip, and given its proximity to this uh, IEEE 488 output, uh, sorry, input, and uh, I think this is, must be the uh, IEEE, con uh, IEEE controller chip. And also it's socketed because, you know, not all options uh, have this chip in this unit. So that makes perfect sense. Now the brain of this uh, uh, WaveTech 395 is actually this MC68331 CFC 1632-bit microcontroller. Now this microcontroller, um, I, I actually am not quite familiar with it, but it is a 32-bit, so it does have a lot of uh, function, uh, you know, cool functionality built in. And uh, even though I can't see what is here, but this one presumably is the uh, uh, some of the EEPROMs. Sorry, this one is the EEPROM that uh, stores either the configuration or the instruction. And same with these EEPROMs uh, right here. So that is pretty much what is inside this unit. 
and uh, now I didn't want to take it off, uh, take the board out because uh, you know not only has some uh, I have to take this BNCs out and uh, have to loosen this connector, but also the front panel. I'm not sure if uh, there's anything that I need to remove. Now that said, um, this front panel is probably really nothing to it. It's just a display and input and uh, the data. You know, there's some rotary encoder here, so there's really nothing exciting to see. But uh, actually, I did make make a mistake. This is actually not a uh, four layer, uh, not a two layer board. It's rather a four layer. How do I know that? Well, if you look at uh, the edge here, you will see that we have one, two, and the three, four is for the other side. But as you can see the picture um, that I took when I was uh, flipping this uh, unit um, around that there was nothing on the bottom. So, so uh, the extra ground and power layer probably just added for uh, reducing noise and better uh, shielding. I almost forgot to mention that the BNC on these units are actually uh, isolated. So as you can see here, there is a uh, capacitor between the earth ground, which is the chassis, and uh, the BNC ground. So this is just for uh, reducing noise. Now I just put the uh, WaveTech 395 arbitrary waveform generator back together. And I thought I would do a couple of uh, testing to show the capabilities of this arbitrary waveform generator. And the noise you can hear in the background are actually coming from my uh, spectrum analyzer and uh, the signal generator and also the uh, frequency counter. So by the way, right now the frequency counter sh is showing the uh, crystal oscillator output from the arbitrary waveform generator. And that was a nominal 10 megahertz crystal and as you can see uh, it is really spot on it's quite accurate so of course you can always improve the stability by changing that oscillator from the internal one to an external organized uh, or even a rubidium frequency reference but uh, for our purpose this should be more than uh, accurate enough when first powered on the frequency sorry, the arbitrary waveform generator, uh, the default output is off. So we can turn it on and uh, the output is actually a one megahertz, uh, what, sorry, one kilohertz sinusoidal wave. And as you can see that uh, uh, there's no problem there. And we can come here and change that. We can either change the frequency. Uh, for example, we can change the frequency here or we can change the uh, waveform type. So now we can change it to a square and triangle. And um, let's see what else we have. DC, uh, we can do the ramp and, or the other way around and do the sync. And then you can, you know, we can kind of move on to see uh, other waveforms. It has quite a few. For example, you can do a pulse and uh, which is quite nice if you're doing some testing and you can do digital noise which is a uh, uh, zero ones or plus minus rather and we can do random um, then here's the random output and we can do quite a few different ones so that's the uh, the standard waveforms now, of course, we're more interested in arbitrary waveform, so we can we can hit this button, and now we we uh, got the screen of the arbit arbitrary waveform setup. And I just uh, entered a random one, so let's choose this one. And as we can see, did we choose that one? Um, let's see if we. Uh, Yep, so that's actually our arbitrary waveform. So let's just move it down a little bit, as you can see here. So basically, uh, this one I just modified as standard ramp waveform and added a couple of glitches there. And, uh, you know, we can edit it, for example, right here by modifying this. And we can say we want it to add it waveform. 
and we add it by line draw. So, um, you know, it's uh, quite intuitive. So for example, we can, we'll want to say um, at 512, for example, uh, let's just do 500, that's easier. So the amplitude should be 848. Now we want to, uh, which is roughly half. So now we, we want to say, okay, we want to change it back to, uh, not back to, but we want to add a one, okay? So now if we hit draw line, you can see that we have immediate effect on uh, the actual waveform. And of course, we can also set the waveform frequency and so forth. And uh, so it's pretty much the same as um, what we did with the other waveforms. So now, uh, for example, right now I'm setting the frequency. Um, now it's telling me the clock frequency is five, uh, 50 megahertz. We want to do the waveform frequency. Uh, and it's at 48 kilohertz. So we, let's see if we want to reduce the frequency. No problem, and increase the frequency, no problem at all. So that's some of the basic functionalities. And of course, we also have, um, uh, for example, let's change it back to, let me just zoom out a little bit. So for example, let's now change it back to, um, sine wave okay. and uh, I don't care what the frequency is but uh, just center it yeah we can we can change the mode to uh, have a sweep for example so now the default sweep uh, I think it's uh, I'm actually not sure it's probably from 1 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz I'm, if I have to guess but uh, and as you can see, that's quite nice. So that's pretty much the basic uh, functionality of this arbitrary waveform generator. And now I wanted to show you the spectral uh, purity of this generator. So for that, we're going to use this uh, spectral analyzer and a couple of other function generator and the signal generators for comparison. So as you can see here on um, this spectral analyzer, I set it to uh, have a uh, resolution bandwidth of 300 hertz, and the start frequency is 950 kilohertz. Um, stop frequency is uh, 1 megahertz and uh, 50 kilohertz. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first of all come back here and uh, I'm gonna do it continuous, and we're just going to generate a sine wave. Okay, at frequency of one megahertz. So it's one six hertz. Okay, one megahertz. And of course, here uh, we have to let's change the time scale to uh, 200 nanosecond. And you can see the actual waveform. What we're going to do is we're going to change that. We're going to hook that up to the spectral analyzer and see what the frequency response looks like. Now, words of caution is that um, um, since we can't put any DC input into that spectral analyzer, so we want to make sure that we're absolutely certain that output of this uh, from this uh, uh, arbitrary wave generator should be zero. If you look at it here, we do have the capability to add offset, which is a you know which we need to make sure that is zero. Right now, it says it's zero volt, so and the frequency is one megahertz. Oh, by the way, I wanted to set uh, the amplitude to zero dBm, and right now it's uh, in the, in the volt mode, so I change it back to dBm, and now it's a 10 dBm. So let's set to zero uh, dBm. Okay. So now let me discontinue, uh, not discontinue, disconnect this uh, wire and uh, put the cable onto our frequency, our spectral analyzer. So hang on, just give me one second. I'm going to hook this right up here. So now you can see that uh, this is the spectrum generated by this uh, WaveTech 395 uh, at one megahertz. And it is really uh, clean. And as you can see that um, we have a really, really narrow frequency.
and uh, just for comparison and uh, this should compare quite uh, nice, nicely to the uh, uh, 8642B. So here uh, if I just discontinu disconnect, keep saying discontinue, disconnect from this, the arbitrary waveform generator and uh, hook it up to the output of this um, Um, 8642B and now you can see that um, it's almost identical to the wave the spectrum that we just saw a 0 dB spectrum and um, as a comparison the actual output is actually quite uh, um, not as good on a for example a much cheaper uh, BK Precision 4011 so let me just put it here and that one right now is also at roughly one megahertz so let's take a look at what the output looks like okay so the output here as you can see uh, it is quite noisy so definitely has a lot of phase noise uh, on that uh, synthesize the signal from that uh, function generator. So as you, as you can see that this WaveTech actually uh, performs really, really well compared to our uh, quite standard 80s, 8642B. Just for fun, the next test I want to do is uh, to see what the spectrum of the uh, noise looks like. Of course, we all know that noise, uh, if it's white noise, the spectrum should be re relatively flat. So let's take a look at uh, if that's the case for this arbitrary waveform generator. And for that, I want to select uh, the waveform to be, let's see, to be analog noise. Okay. And uh, it does take some time to build that analog noise. Depends on uh, how many points you choose to to have. So let's wait till it's done. And right now we have let's see, we have 8,191 uh, uh, points. That should be plenty. And um, let's see, it start at zero hertz stop at uh, 10 uh, well stop we should be let's do a 10 megahertz 10 6 hertz 10 megahertz okay so now let's uh, do next exit oh sorry exit and it's building it again by the way this uh, display button um, Whenever it touches it, it actually changes the uh, the contrast, so it's really annoying. Sometimes I touch that by mistake. So okay, so this contrast looks good. So let's see uh, what the frequency is. So right now the sample frequency is at uh, 98 uh, megahertz. So these are just some of the confirmation statistics. So now let's uh, change our spectrum analyzer to start at let's see we start at one megahertz okay we stop at let's say 15 megahertz now let's change the resolution bandwidth to um, three kilohertz that should be good so now again uh, we want to make sure the amplitude right now let's set it as uh, let's keep it here um, until we, uh, we put this up so now let's increase the amplitude okay and as you can see that uh, let's just change it to uh, One volt, and I'm not sure if you can see this, but uh, we can see a very sharp drop at roughly um, one megahertz 
because we, we stopped at, uh, sorry, 10 megahertz, we stopped at 15 megahertz. And you can see that the power, the power spectrum is really flat in that region, which is what the white noise should be. Okay, so I think that's uh, all I wanted to show for this uh, WaveTech 395. And uh, hope you enjoyed the video. If you learned something new and uh, if you liked the video, please give it a big thumbs up. And I will catch up with you next time.